Ramsey TV. There's a curfew. There is a curfew in Fort Lauderdale. Can anybody tell me why? Now it has to do with the, of course, the dreaded uh, CV19er. I have to talk in code here because if I say it, uh, they will monitor me, and then I'll be in big trouble. I'll be in danger of uh, being being censored. You see, you have to. You can't say certain things nowadays. I don't want to lose all my spiritual content on here just because I want to put a splashy title on my show. Uh, so I'm gonna play it. I'm gonna play it mm, close to the vest here. CV one niner. Yeah, they have um, a curfew, 10 o'clock p.m. in Fort Lauderdale. So apparently, um, you you can't get the CV nineteen at 9:59. It's safe. You're okay. We can be out. We can be out here at 9:59. But 10:01. Oh, don't even talk to me about 10:01, my friends. 10:01, the demon lurks behind every restaurant door. Yes, 10:01. We must all go home and go to bed because the government told us when to go home and go to bed. Government tells us where to stand. The government tells us where to walk. And the government tells us when we need to go home and go to bed. And why don't the government just hand us a teddy bear and 100 yards of bubble wrap and say, Nighty night, bye bye now. I'm not happy about this situation. Uh, why? What's with this uh, his and her face masks? Isn't this cute? Yeah, you see a couple, and they have their little teddy bear. One has a little. The woman has a teddy bear. The guy has like hockey sticks on his face. Man, ooh, they're all, they're all making fashion statements. People are making fashion statements with these stupid masks. Don't they realize that our constitutional rights are being taken away? We're being herded like sheep into a mulcher, and these people are. Oh, look what I got! I got a mask with a little doggy nose on it. Ooh. This is, it's like the kids who played ho hockey. Yeah, yeah, that's what I want to say. The kids who played hockey with the ice chunks on the deck of the Titanic after it struck the iceberg. It, it truly happened. Truly happened. Titanic struck the iceberg in the North Atlantic, 1912, and uh, chunks of ice were on the deck. Ooh, isn't this fun? Ooh, let's... The kids were kicking around chunks of ice. Oh, this is fun. You people are playing with your own enslavement. What the hell is the matter with you? Uh, my landlady, Juliana, her cousin, no fan of Trump, Lucy, uh, but she's tired of this stuff. She goes, when's this stuff going to stop? Yeah, that's a great question. Oh, Manfred and me. We were up at, uh, no, not Sanford and Son, Manfred and I, excuse me, Manfred and I were up at the Drunken Taco a couple weeks ago. That's right, the Drunken Taco. And um, they're, they're tightening the regulations now, tightening them. Can anyone tell me why? No, I didn't think so. So it used to be where you came into a place where actually we're sitting outside at the Drunken Taco, and we're trying to get a table, we're, and we the thing is now once you sit down at the table you can take your stupid masks off you have to walk in or out with your mask on but when you sit down you can take it off not at the drunken taco no now you can't take your mask off until they serve you a beverage yeah so you have to sit there until you get served something so apparently uh you're completely safe if you're sitting in the same spot and sipping water. Everybody's safe from you. But if you don't have anything in your hand to sip, then you are a great danger to your fellow citizens. So my suggestion is to take a little vial of water with you, and as soon as you sit down, just start sipping it. Yeah, you got to cheat. Why aren't people cheating? I'm cheating all the time. I'm cheating all the time. So now they tell me at my gym, get this, the YMCA. And this is a county thing, because the YMCA has to know this is absolutely unsafe there for our own safety now we have to wear masks while we work out yeah while we work out that sounds safe yeah you're hyperventilating and you're breathing in your own poisonous gas at a rapid rate what could go wrong there you know how could that this is for your safety for your safety when you're on the treadmill doing uh 10 sp sprints incrementally uh and you're yeah we're, we, we want you to wear the mask breathe in your own co2 Breathe in your own exhaust. No, I won't do it. 
I won't do it. And so th this is called um, non-compliance. Man, that's the common term for it, non-compliance. Uh, it's just that, and the people at the YMCA know this is stupid, so they're not enforcing it. What, they can have a county official come down? At, yeah, you're, yeah, they probably will. Yeah, they probably will have a county official come down, check it out, make sure we're all obeying the law. No, no, sorry, sorry. I'm always wearing my mask down here if I have to wear a mask at all. There's a people in their cars wearing masks in their cars by themselves. Don't they realize they're being herded? This, people are getting way too used to this. They don't know where it's leading. Yeah. And so what, are you trying to protect yourself from yourself in your car? Protect yourself from yourself so you don't get it from yourself? You don't get the CV-19? How, why, don't you, why don't you just go the, dis, the distance and social distance? Yeah, cut yourself in half so that you can keep yourself six feet apart from yourself. Por favor. Por favor. Uh, yeah, I had a friend in California who just came uh, back. She said, everybody's wearing masks there. Everybody. Everybody. When they're running on the street, everybody, everybody. They're so... I'm sorry, if you're in California, I'm sorry that you are there. I really am. I really am. For your mental health, you've got to cheat. Please cheat. But one more thing before I get into Galatians chapter 2. This is a rant. I can't talk about it uh, in the title. I can't make a splashy title, which will get me an extra 2,000 views. Uh, it's not worth it. It's not worth getting censored. Uh, so can anybody tell me, I mean, why our healthcare workers are heroes? Why are the people who working working in hospitals and doctors? Somebody tell me why they're heroes. I'm seeing signs all over the place saying, "We love you. We appreciate our frontline workers. Frontline workers. Is this World War Three? Is this uh, the Civil War? Frontline workers. We have Florence Nightingale out here somewhere. Was she a nurse or a singer? I forget. Anyway, <laughs> Clara Barton. What's happening here? Why? If they're not getting paid, I can see sort of kind of if they're volunteering. Are these people getting paid like they're $50 an hour? I mean, I don't. I'm happy that people have jobs. I really am. I'm thankful that there are. Well, I almost said I'm thankful there are health care professionals. I guess I am. Yes, of course. But they, they wanted to do this. Why are they heroes? They applied for this. They went to school for it. They're valuable. Uh, but why should we? Put them out as a, like, there's how brave they're going into the maw of the beast. They're going into the front lines of battle. Uh, are they getting paid $50 an hour? Yeah, they are. Oh, and they they wanted to do this? Okay, then. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. And firemen. I'm sorry. Why are firemen heroes? They want to do this. They went to school to be firemen. This is their job. They're not heroes. This is their job. This is their job. I appreciate them. Glad they're out there. The police force, I'm glad they're out there. They're doing their job. Why, why aren't anybody else the heroes? Oh, and this. Thank God for our essential workers. Our essential workers are so essential. The people working at the 7-Eleven in the grocery store. Noble jobs. Not putting it down at all. I'm just ridiculing this fact that we're so grateful for them. They, they should be grateful to us. They're some of the only people that have freaking jobs and they're getting paid. Heroes... Why are their jobs essential and somebody else's job isn't? The insurance salesman, his job is essential. What's Why, why doesn't he get a the guy digging a ditch? Why isn't his job essential? The people at the car wash, why aren't their jobs essential? Oh, we appreciate, we love, we love our front line. What front line? Are you at a war? Even soldiers, they want to be there. Now, if somebody goes above and beyond the call of duty and they risk their neck when they really don't have to they could have just sat back and smoked a cigarette or something yes they're heroes the guy standing by the subway who goes jumps down in front of the train in front of the speeding train to pull an elderly person off the track that's a hero that's a hero don't make me redefine my definition my definition of hero by calling these people who are getting paid to do what they want to do what they dreamed of doing since, since they were kids since this guy was a kid he wants to be a fireman not make i'm not belittling firemen but the kid wants to be a fireman his entire life. Then he goes and he gets to be one. And he wears the big hat and the big coat and he puts out fires. That's great. That's your job. You love it. You want to do it. What a hero. Why? How? 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 All right. Do I consider myself a, a hero? 
No, I'm doing my job. I'm doing my job. Now, if I climbed a 100-foot tree to rescue a kitten, then I'd be a hero. Then I would be a hero. If I'm voluntarily risking my life and nobody's paying me $50 an hour to rescue the kitten, then I'm a hero. Yeah. Otherwise, don't bring me this. Don't bring me this. All right. Paul says in Galatians chapter 2, I'm going to do Galatians, then I'm going to do Romans 8. I should be able to do these in uh, in uh, one day each. I should, but now that I have this mask rant about the CB19, I don't know. Okay, it's going to be touch and go here, but we're going to see what we can do. Oh, and then I'm going to go to Paul's statement, I belabor my body. Where do you see what that word belabor means? Because that sounds like it undoes everything I've been telling you. You say, Paul, you say uh, Martin, Zender, we, are, we don't have to work on our flesh. We can look to Christ and things in the Holy Spirit, kind of take care of business. What says Paul belaboring his body? Where do I, where do I show you what that word means? Okay, Galatians 2, verse 19. I, Paul talking, I through law died to law that I should be living to God. We have been freed from law. I mean, we were never even under law, those of the nations, but whether it's the law of Moses or whether it's a personal law, which reminds me, what about these Christians who they, we know from Romans chapter 7, this is what Paul is alluding to here, I through law died to law. The law was the thing that produced in him. It was the command not to, not to do something. So these Christians, they, what's the difference is what I'm asking. Settle down. Okay. What's the difference between the law of Moses saying thou shalt not and a Christian telling him or herself, I shall not, I shall not. And then they call it grace. I mean, isn't it law dressed up in new language? Isn't it law dressed up to look acceptable to people? You're really doing law, and you want to do law, and you want to obey God's commands, and you want to be obedient so that you can get special rewards such as salvation. You're working for your, your salvation, but you don't want it to come across like that because everybody knows that, you know, law of Moses, I mean, come on, yeah. We're about grace here at uh, Christian Central. So are you? Are you? What's the difference between giving yourself a challenge that you're going to do in the flesh What's the difference between that and God giving you a challenge a la the law of Moses to, uh, to uh, prove yourself in the flesh to him? I ask you this in a most innocent manner and in the nicest manner I can think of, the most accommodating and respectful manner. What the hell are you doing? Okay, now, I through law died to law that I should be living to God. So the, the idea the whole time that God had in mind was to live toward him. But he had to prove that humanity can't do things of law. So, uh, you know, Paul, let's talk about him here. He had to go through this whole rigmarole. And so through that rigmarole, he found out that the precept, the thou shalt not, only made him want to shout. Yeah. As soon as Paul heard thou shalt not... Ah, never thought of that. Makes me want to shout. And he did. Had not thought of coveting, except the law said, thou shalt not be coveting. And sin, getting an incentive through the precept, produces in me all manner of coveting. That's Paul, Romans chapter 7. I recommend you read it if you haven't already. With law, I died to law. Now he's free. Galatians 5, 1, this same book, for freedom Christ frees you that I should be living to God. Okay, now he's living to God. That's what I've been telling you this whole week. Living to God, toward God. That's your focus, not your flesh. Now he says this, profound. With Christ have I been crucified. I'm in verse 20 of Galatians chapter 2. This is the chapter, this is the book, this is the letter Paul's writing to these uh, people in the body of Christ who Paul had convinced that they were saved by grace through faith, of the faith of Christ, and now they were to live to God, and they were being tricked into thinking that they still had to work on their flesh. With Christ have I been crucified. Romans 6, Romans 6, 6. Our old humanity was crucified with him. Paul says, with Christ have I been crucified. How can you work on I? How can you worry about I if it's been crucified? That's the old humanity. It's dead, yet I am living. True enough, there he is. It's a phenomenon. Paul said, I was crucified with Christ. Ah, poor guy, let's go to his funeral. No, wait, wait a minute, I am living. Oh, but then he says, no longer I. What? What do you mean? But living in me is Christ. Oh, I think we need Martin Zender to tell us 
what this means. Well, I'm here. I'm the guy that's available. I mean, you probably can figure it out on your own. But when he says no longer I, he's talking about the old I. He's talking about the old humanity I that was crucified with Christ. That humanity is no longer living. That's, no, that's done. That was taken to the cross, crucified. And like I told you yesterday, you know, crucify your passions and lusts, put them on the cross, ignore them, they die of starvation. But here's Paul living and breathing as he writes this letter. So he's still living, but it's not any longer the old him. But And he doesn't even say it's a new me. He says living in me is Christ. So now he's apprehending the fact that Christ is the main operating system in his system. So that which I am now living in flesh, he admits he's still in flesh, that which I am now living in flesh, he's talking about the new I, the I that Christ inhabits is still in flesh because our bodies have not been changed yet. Our minds have been changed. Our focus has been changed. Our disposition has been changed. Going to get to that in Romans 8. But our bodies have not yet been changed. Romans 6 tells you this plainly, that the body of sin may be nullified. It hasn't happened yet, if you haven't noticed. So that which I am now living, this is good. Now, that which I am now living in flesh, I'm living in faith. This is what I told you. We no longer know anyone according to flesh, 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Even if we have known Christ according to flesh, we know him so no longer. So when Paul says, I think it's verse 14, we're not to know anyone according to the flesh, and that includes us. So the life he's living in flesh, Paul, still living in flesh, just as we are, he's living in faith. Yeah, what faith? The faith that he's justified in spite of what he's seeing. The fact that he's righteous with God in spite of what he's doing. He turns a blind eye to all the bad things he's doing, and yet he's still doing bad things. This guy's not perfect. He'd be the first one to tell you if he could come here, walk in this kitchen, and you people thought I was perfect when I was writing these letters? No. The life I am living in flesh, I'm living in faith that is of the Son of God. There it is. That's another great truth. The faith is of the Son of God. It's not Paul's faith who loves me, there's a lost teaching. Yeah, Christ loves you even as you walk. Now, Christ loves you. J Jesus Christ loves you, loves you. He even likes you right now as you stand and your smoldering pile of crap. He loves you because the old humanity has been crucified. As I told you before, God could not justify the old humanity. He couldn't look at the old humanity and say, that's righteous. Couldn't. Something had to be done. Something had to be done that was unmistakably great. That was a real highlight. Uh, that was um, the greatest hits of God that would never be forgotten. And this was that the old humanity was crucified with Christ. This is how God considered it. He put everything, every sin of every human being on that one man, capital M. And that did it. Nobody could say, well, God, you didn't do anything about the old humanity. Are you kidding me? So the old humanity is crucified. But this is a revelation that we apprehend with our mind, come to a realization and recognition of that truth, as Paul says in Ephesians. And it's of faith because the body is still doing its old thing. Okay, the body's still doing its own thing. But, but God says, still pronounces you righteous right now. He considers you righteous. How can that be? Because he did something about the old humanity. He did something. It was graphic. He did something graphically, unmistakably with the old humanity. What did he do? Crucified it with Christ. Jesus Christ loves you. Think about that. Loves me and gives himself up for me. Paul says, I'm not repudiating the grace of God. Are you kidding? You don't even have to say that. But he does. Because of this next statement. For if righteousness is through law, consequently, Christ died gratuitously. Christ died for no reason. If righteousness comes by way of a law that God just puts out there and then sits back and sees if you can do it. God knew they couldn't do it, and yet he came across as though, go ahead, do this law. Yeah. Bring me your sheep, bring me your goats, bring me your huddled masses of livestock yearning to breathe free. Let's see how that works out. He knew how it was going to work out, but humans didn't. 
So it wasn't an experiment for God. It was a demonstration for the sake of humanity. No righteousness came from that route. But now righteousness does come through a pronouncement of God that is totally of grace. It comes from the faith of Christ in going to the cross for our sins. Jesus Christ took away our sins at the cross. Not only that, not only the things we did. No, he went to the root. He didn't just take away this thing you did, that thing you did, the other thing you did. He went to the root cause of the sins, which is sin itself, which came from Adam, which can be categorized as the old humanity. Your old humanity was crucified because Jesus Christ loves you. Cru crucified with him. He's writhing in agony, writhing in agony with your sins. And not only that, but your old humanity tied to him because he loved you. And then when he died, he took that old humanity with him and he rose without it. And now he looks at you and goes, boom, you're shining, you're wonderful, you're righteous. And now if we can just freaking believe it.